Section 5 of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3, Part 1. The morning star, large, intensely blue white, magnificent in its dominance of the clear night sky, hung over the dim, dark valley ramparts. The moon had gone down, and all the other stars were wan, pale ghosts. Presently the strained vacuum of John's ears vibrated to a low roar of many hoofs. It came from the open valley along the slope to the south. Shep acted as if he wanted the word to run. Jean laid a hand on the dog. "'Hold on, Shep,' he whispered. Then hauling on his boots and slipping into his coat, Jean took his rifle and stole out into the open. Shep appeared to be well-trained, for it was evident that he had a strong natural tendency to run off and hunt whatever had roused him. Jean thought it more likely that the dog scented an animal of some kind. If men were prowling around the ranch, Shep might have just been as vigilant, but it seemed to Jean that the dog would have shown less eagerness to leave him, or none at all. In the stillness of the morning it took Jean a moment to locate the direction of the wind, which was very light and coming from the south. In fact, that little breeze had borne the low roar of trampling hoofs. Jean circled the ranch house to the right and kept along the slope at the edge of the cedars. It struck him suddenly how well fitted he was for work of this sort. All the work he had ever done, except for his few years in school, had been in the open. All the leisure he had ever been able to obtain had been given to his ruling passion for hunting and fishing. Love of the wild had been born in Jean. At this moment he experienced a grim assurance of what his instinct and his training might accomplish if directed to a stern and daring end. Perhaps his father understood this. Perhaps the old Texan had some little reason for his confidence. Every few paces Jean halted to listen. All objects, of course, were indistinguishable in the dark gray obscurity, except when he came close upon them. Shep showed an increasing eagerness to bolt out into the void. When Jean had traveled half a mile from the house, he heard a scattered trampling of cattle on the run, and farther out a low strangled bawl of a calf. Uh-huh, muttered Jean. Cougar or some varmint pulled down that calf. Then he discharged his rifle in the air and yelled with all his might. It was necessary then to yell again to hold Shep back. Thereupon Jean set forth down the valley and tramped out and across and around, as much to scare away whatever had been after the stock as to look for the wounded calf. More than once he heard cattle moving away ahead of him, but he could not see them. Jean let Shep go, hoping the dog would strike a trail. But Shep gave neither tongue nor came back. Dawn began to break, and in the growing light, Jean searched around until at last he stumbled over a dead calf, lying in a little bare wash where water ran in wet seasons. Big wolf tracks showed in the soft earth. Loafer, said Jean, as he knelt and just covered one track with his spreading hand. We had wolves in Oregon, but not as big as these. Wonder where that half-wolf dog Shep went. Wonder if he can be trusted where wolves are concerned. I'll bet not, if there's a she-wolf running around. Jean found tracks of two wolves, and he trailed them out of the wash, then lost them in the grass. But guided by their direction, he went on and climbed the slope to the cedar line, where in the dusty patches he found the tracks again. Not scared much, he muttered, as he noted the slow, trotting tracks. Well, you old gray loafers, we're going to clash. Jean knew from many futile hunts that wolves were the wariest and most intelligent of wild animals in the quest. From the top of a low foothill he watched the sun rise, and then no longer wondered why his father waxed eloquent over the beauty and location and luxuriance of this grassy valley but it was large enough to make rich a good many ranchers. 
Jean tried to restrain any curiosity as to his father's dealings in Grass Valley until the situation had been made clear. Moreover, John wanted to love this wonderful country. He wanted to be free to ride and hunt and roam to his heart's content, and therefore he dreaded hearing his father's claims. But Jean threw off forebodings. Nothing ever turned out so badly as it presaged. He would think the best until certain of the worst. The morning was gloriously bright, and already the frost was glistening wet on the stones. Grass Valley shone like burnished silver, dotted with innumerable black spots. Burrows were braying their discordant message to one another. The colts were romping in the fields. Stallions were whistling. Cows were bawling. A cloud of blue smoke hung low over the ranch house, slowly wafting away on the wind. Far out in the valley, a dark group of horsemen were riding toward the village. Jean glanced thoughtfully at them and reflected that he seemed destined to harbor suspicion of all men, new and strange to him. Above the distant village stood the darkly green foothills leading up to the craggy slopes, and these ending in the rim, a red, black-fringed mountain front, beautiful in the morning sunlight, lonely, serene, and mysterious against the level skyline. Mountains, ranges, distance unknown to Jean, always called to him to come to seek, to explore, to find, but no wild horizon ever before beckoned to him as this one. And the subtle vague emotion that had gone to sleep with him last night awoke now hauntingly. It took effort to dispel the desire to think, to wonder. Upon his return to the house, he went around on the valley side, so as to see the place by daylight. His father had built for permanence, and evidently there had been three constructive periods in the history of that long, substantial, picturesque log house. But few nails and little sawed lumber, and no glass had been used. Strong and skillful hands, axes, and a cross-cut saw had been the prime factors in erecting this habitation of the Isbels. "'Good morning, son,' called a cheery voice from the porch. "'Sure we all heard your shoot, and the crack of that forty-four was as welcome as May flowers.' Bill Isbel looked up from a task over a saddle girth and inquired pleasantly if Jean ever slept of nights. Guy Isbel laughed, and there was warm regard in the gaze he bent on Jean. "'The old Indian,' he drawled slowly. "'Did you get a bead on anything?' No, I shot to scare away what I found to be some of your loafers, replied Jean. I heard them pulling down a calf, and I found tracks of two whoppin' big wolves. I found the dead calf, too. Reckon the meat can be saved. Dad, you must lose a lot of stock here. Well, son, you sure hit the nail on the head, replied the rancher. What with lions and bears and loafers, and two-footed loafers of another breed, I've lost five thousand dollars in stock this last year. Dad, you don't mean it, exclaimed Jean in astonishment. To him that sum represented a small fortune. I sure do, answered his father. Jean shook his head as if he could not understand such an enormous loss where there were keen, able-bodied men about. But that's awful, Dad. How could it happen? Where were your herders and cowboys and Bill and Guy? Bill Isbel shook a vehement fist at Jean and retorted in earnest, having manifestly been hit in a sore spot. Where was me and Guy, huh? Well, my Oregon brother, we was here all year sleepin', more or less, about three hours out of every twenty-four, riding our boots off, and we couldn't keep down that loss. Jean, you all have a mighty tumble coming to you out here, said Guy complacently. Listen, son, spoke up the rancher. You want to have some hunches before you figure on our troubles. There's two or three packs of loafers, and in the wintertime they are hell to deal with. Lions thick as bees, and sure bad when the snow's on. Bears will kill a cow now and then, and whenever an old silver tip comes moseying across the Mazatels, he kills stock. I'm in with a half a dozen cattlemen. We all work together, 
and the whole outfit can't keep these varmints down. Two years ago, the Hash Knife Gang come into the Tonto. Hash Knife Gang? What a pretty name, replied Jean. Who are they? Rustler's son, and sure the real old Texas brand. The old Lone Star State got too hot for them, and they followed the trail of a lot of other Texans who needed a healthier climate. Some two hundred Texans around here, Jean, and maybe a matter of three hundred inhabitants in the Tonto, all told, good and bad. Reckon it's about half and half. A cheery call from the kitchen interrupted the conversation of the men. You come to breakfast. During the meal, the old rancher talked to Bill and Guy about the day's order of work, and from this, Jean gathered an idea of what a big cattle business his father conducted. After breakfast, Jean's brothers manifested keen interest in the new rifles. These were unwrapped and cleaned, and taken out for testing. The three rifles were forty-four caliber Winchesters, the kind of gun Jean had found most effective. He tried them out first, and the shots he made were satisfactory to him and amazing to the others. Bill had used an old Henry rifle. Guy did not favor any particular rifle. The rancher pinned his faith to the famous old single-shot buffalo gun, mostly called needle gun. Well, reckon I'd better stick to mine. Sure you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But you boys may do well with the forty-fours. Pack em on your saddles and practice when you see a coyote. Jean found it difficult to convince himself that this interest in guns and marksmanship had any sinister propulsion back of it. His father and brothers had always been this way. Rifles were as important to pioneers as plows, and their skillful use was an achievement every frontiersman tried to attain. Friendly rivalry had always existed among the members of the Isbel family. Even Aunt Isabel was a good shot. But such proficiency in the use of firearms and life in the open that was co-relative with it had not dominated them as it had John. Bill and Guy Isabel were born cattlemen, chips off the old block. John began to hope that his father's letter was an exaggeration, and particularly that the fatalistic speech of last night, they're going to kill me, was just a moody inclination to see the worst side. Still, even as John tried to persuade himself of this more hopeful view, he recalled many references to the peculiar reputation of Texans for gun-throwing, for feuds, for never-ending hatreds. In Oregon, the Isabels had lived among industrious and peaceful pioneers from all over the states, to be sure. The life had been rough and primitive, and there had been fights on occasions, though no Isabel had ever killed a man. But now they had become fixed in a wider and sparsely settled country among men of their own breed. Jean was afraid his hopes had only sentiment to foster them. Nevertheless, he forced back a strange, brooding mental state and resolutely held up the brighter side. Whatever the evil conditions existing in Grass Valley, they could be met with intelligence and courage, and with an absolute certainty that it was inevitable they must pass away. Jean refused to consider the old fatal law, that at certain wild times and wild places in the West, certain men had to pass away to change evil conditions. Well, Jean, ride around the range with the boys, said the rancher. Meet some of my neighbors, Jim Blaisdell in particular. Take a look at the cattle and pick out some horses for yourself. I've seen one already, declared Jean quickly. A black with white face. I'll take him. Sure you know a horse. To my eye, he's my pick. But the boys don't agree. Bill especially has degenerated into a fancier of pitching horses. Anne can ride that black. You try him this morning, and, son, enjoy yourself. True to his first impression, John named the black horse White Face and fell in love with him before he ever swung a leg over him. Whiteface appeared spirited yet gentle. 
he had been trained instead of being broken. Of hard hits and quirks and spurs he had no experience. He liked to do what his rider wanted him to do. A hundred or more horses grazed in the grassy meadow, and as John rode on among them, it was a pleasure to see stallions throw heads and ears up and whistle or snort. Whole troops of colts and two-year-olds raced with flying tails and manes. Beyond these pastures stretched the range, and Jean saw the gray-green expanse speckled by thousands of cattle. The scene was inspiring. Jean's brothers led him all around, meeting some of the herders and riders employed on the ranch, one of whom was a burly, grizzled man with eyes reddened and narrowed by much riding in wind and sun and dust. His name was Everts, and he was the father of the lad who Jean had met near the village. Everts was busy skinning the calf that had been killed by the wolves. "'See here, you Jean Isabel,' said Everts. "'It sure was about time you come home. "'We all hears you have an eyes for tracks. "'Maybe you can kill old Gray, the loafer that did this job. "'He's pulled down nine calves as yearlings "'this last two months that I know of, "'and we've not held the spring roundup.' "'Grass Valley widened to the southeast. "'Jean would have been backward about estimating "'the square miles in it. "'Yet it was not vast acreage so much as rich pasture that made it such a wonderful range. Several ranches lay along the western slope of this section. Jean was informed that open parks and swales, and little valleys nestling among the foothills, wherever there was water and grass, had been settled by ranchers. Every summer a few new families ventured in. Blaisdell struck Jean as being a lion-like type of Texan. Both in his broad, bold face, his huge head with its upstanding tawny hair like a mane, and in the speech and force that betokened the nature of his heart. He was not as old as Jean's father. He had a rolling voice with the same drawling intonation characteristic of all Texans, and blue eyes that still held the fire of youth. Quite a marked contrast he presented to the lean, rangy, hard-jawed, intent-eyed men Jean had become to accept as Texans. Blaisdell took time for a curious scrutiny and study of Jean. That, frank and kindly as it was, was evidently the adjustment of impressions gotten from hearsay, yet bespoke, the attention of one used to judging men for himself, and in this particular case having reasons of his own for so doing. "'Well, you're like your sister Anne,' said Blaisdell, "'which you may take as a compliment, young man. "'Both of you favor your mother. "'But you're an Isbel. "'Back in Texas, there are men who never wear a glove on their right hands, "'and sure I reckon if one of them met up with you sudden, "'he'd think some graves had opened, and he'd go for his gun.' "'Blaisdell's laughed, peeled out with deep, pleasant roll. Thus he planted in Jean's sensitive mind a significant, thought-provoking idea about the past and gone Isabel's. His further remarks, likewise, were exceedingly interesting to Jean. The settling of the Tonto Basin by Texans was a subject oft in dispute. His own father had been in the first party of adventurous pioneers who had traveled up from the south to cross over the Reno Pass of the Mazatals into the basin. Newcomers from the outside get the impression of the Tonto, according to the first settlers they meet, declared Baysdell. And sure it's my belief these first impressions never change. Just so strong they are. Well, I've heard my father say there were men in his wagon train that got run out of Texas, but he swore he wasn't one of them. So I reckon that sort of talk held good for twenty years, and for all the Texans who emigrated, except, of course, such notorious rustlers as Dags and men of his ilk. Sure, we got some bad men here. There's no law. Possession used to mean more than it does now. Dags and his hash-knife gang have begun to hold forth with a high hand. 
No small rancher can keep enough stock to pay for his labor. At the time of which Blaisdell spoke, there were not many sheepmen and cattlemen in the Tonto, considering its vast area. But these, on account of the extreme wildness of the broken country, were limited to the comparatively open Grass Valley and its adjacent environs. Naturally, as the inhabitants increased and stock raising grew in proportion, the grazing and water rights became a matter of extreme importance. Sheepmen ran their flocks up on the rim in the summertime and down in the basin in wintertime. A sheepman could throw a few thousand sheep round a cattleman's ranch and ruin him. The range was free. It was as fair for sheepmen to graze their herds anywhere as it was for cattlemen. This, of course, did not apply to the few acres of cultivated ground that a rancher could call his own. But very few cattle could have been raised on such limited area. Blaisdell said that the sheepmen were unfair because they could have done just as well, though perhaps at more labor, by keeping to the ridges and leaving the open valley and little flats to the ranchers. Formerly, there had been room enough for all. Now the grazing ranges were being encroached upon by sheepmen newly come to the Tonto. To Blaisdell's way of thinking, the rustler menace was more serious than the sheeping off of the range, for the simple reason that no cattleman knew exactly who the rustlers were and for the more complex and significant reason that the rustlers did not steal sheep. Texas was overstocked with bad men and fine steers, concluded Blaisdell. Most of the first and some of the last have struck the Tonto. The sheepmen have now got distributing points for wool and sheep at Maricopa and Phoenix. They're sure waxing strong and bold. Uh-huh. And what's likely to come of this mess? queried John. Ask your dad, replied Blaisdell. I will, but I reckon I'd be obliged for your opinion. Well, the short and sweet is this. Texas cattlemen will never allow the range they stocked to be overrun by sheepmen. Who's this man Greaves? went on Jean. Never run into anyone like him. Greaves is hard to figure. He's a snaky customer in deals, but he seems to be good to the poor around here. Says he's from Missouri. <laughs> he's as much a Texan as I am. But he rode into Tonto without even a pack to his name. And presently he builds his stone house and freights supplies in from Phoenix. Appears to buy and sell a good deal of stock. For a while it looked like he was steering a middle course between cattlemen and sheepmen. Both sides made a rendezvous of his store, where he heard the grievances of each. Lately, he's been leaning to the sheepmen. Nobody has accused him of that yet, but it's time some cattlemen called his bluff. Of course, there are honest and square sheepmen in the basin, queried John. Yes, and some of them are not unreasonable. But the new fellows that dropped in on us the last few years, they're the ones we're going to clash with. This sheepman Jorth went on John in slow hesitation, as if compelled to ask what he would rather not learn. Jorth must be the leader of this sheep faction that's harrying us ranchers. He doesn't make threats or roar around like some of them, but he goes on raising and buying more and more sheep. And his herders have been grazing down all around us this winter. Jorth's got to be reckoned with. Who is he? Well, I don't know enough to talk about. Your dad never said so, but I think he and Jorth knew each other in Texas years ago. I never saw Jorth but once. That was in Greaves' bar room. Your dad and Jorth met that day for the first time in this country. Well, I've not known men for nothing. They just stood stiff and looked at each other. Your dad was about to draw, but Jorth made no sign to throw a gun. Jean saw the growing and weaving and thickening of threads of a tangle that had already involved him. And the sudden pang of regret he sustained was not wholly because of sympathies with his own people. The other day up in the woods on the rim, I ran into a sheepman 
who said his name was Coulter. Who is he? Coulter? Sure he's a new one. What'd he look like? Jean described Coulter with a readiness that spoke volumes for the vividness of his impressions. I don't know him, replied Blaisdell, but that only goes to prove my contention. Any fellow running wild in the woods can say he's a sheepman. Coulter surprised me by calling me by my name, continued John. Our little talk wasn't exactly friendly. He said a lot about me being sent for to run sheep herders out of the country. Sure, that's all over, replied Blaisdell seriously. You're a marked man already. What started such a rumor? Sure, you can't prove it by me, but it's not taken as rumor. It's got the sheepmen as hard as bullets. Aha. Uh -huh. That accounts for Coulter seeming a little sore under the collar. Well, he said, they were going to run sheep over Grass Valley, and for me to take that hunch to my dad. Blaisdell had his chair tilted back and his heavy boots against the post of the porch. Down he thumped. His neck corded with a sudden rush of blood, and his eyes changed to blue fire. The hell he did, he ejaculated, in furious amaze. Jean gauged the brooding, rankling hurt of this old cattleman by his sudden break from the cool, easy Texan manner. Blaisdell cursed under his breath, swung his arms violently, as if to throw a last doubt or hope aside, and then relapsed to his former state. He laid a brown hand on Jean's knee. Two years ago, I called the cards,' he said quietly. "'It means a Grass Valley War.' Not until late that afternoon did John's father broach the subject uppermost in his mind. Then, at an opportune moment, he drew Jean away into the cedars out of sight. "'Son, I sure hate to make your homecoming unhappy,' he said, with evidence of agitation. "'But so help me God, I have to do it.' "'Dad, you called me prodigal.' and I reckon you are right. I've shirked my duty to you. I'm ready now to make up for it, replied Jean, feelingly. Well, well, sure that's fine spoken, my boy. Let's sit down here and have a long talk. First off, what did Jim Blaisdell tell you? End of Chapter 3, Part 1《Six of To the Last Man》by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, Part Two. Briefly, Jean outlined the neighbor rancher's conversation. Then Jean recounted his experience with Coulter, and concluded with Blaisdell's reception of the sheepman's threat. If Jean expected to see his father rise up like a lion in his wrath, he made a huge mistake. This news of Coulter and his talk never struck even a spark from Gaston Isbel. Well, he began thoughtfully, reckon there are only two points in Jim's talk I need touch on. There's sure going to be a Grass Valley War, and Jim's idea of the cause of it seems to be pretty much the same as that of all the other cattlemen. It'll go down as a black blot on the history page of the Tonto Basin, as a war between rival sheepmen and cattlemen. Same old fight over water and grass. Jean, my son, that is wrong. It'll not be a war between sheepmen and cattlemen, but a war of honest ranchers against rustlers masking as sheep raisers. Mind you, I don't belittle the trouble between sheepmen and cattlemen in Arizona. It's real, it's vital, and it's serious. It'll take law and order to straighten out the grazing question. Some day the government will keep sheep off of cattle ranges. So get things right in your mind, my son. You can trust your dad to tell the absolute truth. In this fight, that'll wipe out some of the Isabels, maybe all of them. You're on the side of justice and right. Knowing that, a man can fight a hundred times harder than he who knows he is a liar and a thief. The old rancher wiped his perspiring face and breathed slowly and deeply. Jean sensed in him the rise of a tremendous emotional strain. Wonderingly, 
he watched the keen, lined face. More than material worries were at the root of brooding, mounting thoughts in his father's eyes. Now take what Jim said about your coming to chase these sheep herders out of the valley. Jean, I started that talk. I had my tricky reasons. I know these greaser sheep herders, and I know the respect Texans have for a gunman. Some say I bragged. Some say I'm an old fool in his dotage, raving about a favorite son. But there are people who hate me and are afraid. True, son, I talked with a purpose, but sure I was mighty cold and steady when I did. My feeling was that you'd do what I'd do if I were thirty years younger. No, I reckon you'd do more. For I figured on your blood, John. You're an Indian and a Texan and French, and you've trained yourself in the Oregon woods. When you were only a boy, few marksmen I ever knew could beat you, and I never saw your equal for eye and ear for tracking a horse and for all the gifts that make a woodsman. Well, remembering this, and seeing the trouble ahead for the Isbels, I just broke out whenever I had a chance. I bragged before men I'd reason to believe who would take my words deep. For instance, not long ago, I missed some stock, and happening in the Greaves' place one Saturday night, I sure talked loud. His bar room was full of men, and some of them were in my black book. Greaves took my talk a little testy. He said, Well, Gas, maybe you're right about some of these cattle thieves living among us, but ain't they just as liable to be some of your friends or relatives as Ted Meeker's or mine, or anyone else around here? That was when Greaves and me fell out. I yelled at him, No, by God, they're not. My record here and that of my people is open. The least I can say for you, Greaves, and your crowd, is that your records fade away on dim trails. Then he said, nasty-like, Well, if you could work out all the dim trails in the Tonto, you'd sure be surprised. And then I roared. Sure, that was the chance I was looking for. I swore the trails he hinted of would be tracked to the holes of the rustlers who made them. I told him I had sent for you, and when you got here, these slippery, mysterious thieves, whoever they were, would sure have hell to pay. Greaves said he hoped so, but he was afraid I was partial to my Indian son. Then we had hot words. Blaisdell got between us. When I was leaving, I took a parting fling at him. Greaves, you ought to know the Isbels. Considering you're from Texas, maybe you've got reason for throwing taunts at my claims for my son Jean. Yes, he's got Indian in him, and that'll be the worst for the men who will have to meet him. I'm telling you, Greaves, Jean Isabel is the black sheep of the family. If you ride down his record, you'll find he's sure in line to be another Pogan, or Reddy Kingfisher, or Hardin, or any of the Texas gunmen you ought to remember. Greaves, there are men rubbing elbows with you right here that my Indian son is going to track down. Jean bent his head in stunned cognizance of the notoriety which his father had chosen to affront any and all Tonto Basin men who were under the ban of his suspicion. What a terrible reputation and trust to have saddled upon him. Thrills and strange, heated sensations seemed to rush together inside Jean, forming a hot ball of fire that threatened to explode. A retreating self made feeble protests. He saw his own pale face going away, from this older, grimmer man. Son, if I could have looked forward to anything but blood spilling, I'd never have given you such a name to uphold, continued the rancher. What I'm going to tell you now is my secret. My other sons and Anne have never heard it. Jim Blisdale suspects there's something strange, but he doesn't know. I'll sure never tell anybody else but you, and you must promise to keep my secret now and after I'm gone. I promise, said Jean. Well, and now to get it out, began his father, breathing hard. His face twitched and his hands clenched. The sheepman here I have to reckon with is Lee Jorth, a lifelong enemy of mine. We were born in the same town, played together as children, 
and fought with each other as boys. We never got along together, and we both fell in love with the same girl. It was nip and tuck for a while. Ellen Sutton belonged to one of the old families of the South. She was a beauty, and much courted, and I reckon it was hard for her to choose. But I won her, and we became engaged. Then the war broke out. I enlisted with my brother Jean. He advised me to marry Ellen before I left, but I would not. That was the blunder of my life. Soon after our parting, her letters ceased to come. But I didn't distrust her. That was a terrible time, and all was confusion. Then I got crippled and put in a hospital, and in about a year I was sent back home. At this juncture, Jean refrained from further gaze at his father's face. Lee Jorth had gotten out of going to war, went on the rancher, in lower, thicker voice. He married my sweetheart, Ellen. I knew the story long before I got well. He had run after her like a hound after a hare, and Ellen married him. Well, when I was able to get about, I went to see Jorth and Ellen. I confronted them. I had to know why she had gone back on me. Lee Jorth hadn't changed any with all his good fortune. He'd made Ellen believe in my dishonor, but I reckon, lies or no lies, Ellen Sutton was faithless. In my absence, he had won her away from me, and I saw that she loved him as she never had me. I reckon that killed all my generosity. If she'd been imposed upon and weaned away by his lies and had regretted me a little, I'd have forgiven, perhaps, but she worshipped him. She was his slave, and I... Well, I learned what hate was. The war ruined the Suttons, same as so many Southerners. Lee Jorth went in for raising cattle. He'd gotten the Sutton range, and after a few years, he began to accumulate stock. In those days, every cattleman was a little bit of a thief. Every cattleman drove in and branded calves he couldn't swear was his. Well, the Isabels were the strongest cattle raisers in that country. And I laid a trap for Lee Jorth, caught him in the act of branding calves of mine I'd marked, and I proved him a thief. I made him a rustler. I ruined him. We met once. But Jorth was one Texan not strong on the draw, at least against an Isbel. He left the country. He had friends and relatives, and they started him at stock raising again. But he began to gamble, and he got in with a shady crowd. He went from bad to worse, and then he came back home. When I saw the change in proud, beautiful Ellen Sutton, and how she still worshipped Jorth, it sure drove me near mad between pity and hate. Well, I reckon in a Texan, hate outlives any other feeling. There came a strange turn of the wheel, and my fortunes changed. Like most young bloods of the day, I drank and gambled. And one night I run across Jorth and a card-sharp friend. He fleeced me. We quarreled. Guns were thrown. I killed my man. About that period, the Texas Rangers had come into existence. And, son, when I said I never was run out of Texas, I wasn't holding to strict truth. I rode out on a horse. I went to Oregon. There I married soon, and there Bill and Guy were born. Their mother did not live long. And next I married your mother, Jean. She had some Indian blood, which, for all I could see, made her only the finer. She was a wonderful woman, and gave me the only happiness I ever knew. You remember her, of course, and those home days in Oregon. I reckon I made another great blunder when I moved to Arizona. But the cattle country had always called me. I had heard of this wild Tonto Basin and how Texans were settling there. And Jim Blaisdell sent me word to come, that this sure was a garden spot of the West. Well, it is. And your mother was gone. Three years ago, Lee Jorth drifted into the Tonto. And strange to me, along about a year or so after his coming, the Hash Knife Gang rode up from Texas. Jorth went in for raising sheep. Along with some other sheepmen, he lives up in the Rim Canyons. Somewhere back in the wild breaks, 
is the hiding place of the Hash Knife Gang. Nobody but me, I reckon, associates Colonel Jorth, as he's called, with Dags and his gang. Maybe Blysdale and a few others have a hunch, but that's no matter. As a sheepman, Jorth has a legitimate grievance with the cattlemen. But what could be settled by a square consideration for the good of all and the future, Jorth will never settle. He'll never settle because he is now no longer an honest man. He's in with Dags. I can't prove this, son, but I know it. I saw it in Jorth's face when I met him that day with Greaves. I saw more. I sure saw what he's up to. He never met me at an even break. He's dead set on using this sheep and cattle feud to ruin my family and me, even as I ruined him. But he means more, Jean. This will be a war between Texans and a bloody war. There are bad men in this Tonto, some of the worst that didn't get shot in Texas. Jorth will have some of these fellows. Now are we going to wait to be sheeped off our range and to be murdered from ambush? No, we are not, replied Jean quietly. Well, come down to the house, said the rancher, and led the way without speaking until he halted by the door. There he placed his finger on a small hole in the wood, about the height of a man's head. Jean saw it was a bullet hole, and that a few gray hairs stuck to its edges. The rancher stepped closer to the doorpost, so that his head was within an inch of the wood. Then he looked at Jean with eyes in which there glinted dancing specks of fire, like wild sparks. Son, the sneakin' shot at me was made three mornings ago. I recollect moving my head just when I heard the crack of a rifle. Sure was surprised, but I got inside quick. Jean scarcely heard the latter part of his speech. He seemed doubled up inwardly in hot and cold convulsions of changing emotion. A terrible hold upon his consciousness was about to break and let go. The first shot had been fired, and he was an Isbel. Indeed, his father had made him ten times an Isbel. Blood was thick. His father did not speak to dull ears. This strife of raising tumult in him seemed the effect of years of calm, of peace in the woods, of dreamy waiting for he knew not what. It was the passionate, primitive life in him that had awakened to the call of blood ties. "'That's about all, son,' concluded the rancher. "'You understand now why I feel they're going to kill me. I feel it here.' With solemn gesture, he placed his broad hand over his heart. "'And, Jean, strange whispers come to me at night. It seems like your mother was calling or trying to warn me.' I can't explain these queer whispers, but I know what I know. Jorth has his followers. You must have yours, replied Jean tensely. Sure, son, and I can take my choice of the best men here, replied the rancher with pride, but I'll not do that. I'll lay the deal before them and let them choose. I reckon it won't be a long-winded fight. It'll be short and bloody, after the way of Texans. I'm looking to you, Jean, to see that an Isbel is the last man. My God, Dad, is there no other way? Think of my sister, Anne, of my brother's wives, and of, of other women. Dad, these damned Texas feuds are cruel, horrible, burst out Jean in passionate protest. Jean, would it be any easier for our women if we let these men shoot us down in cold blood? Oh, no, no, I see. There's no hope of, of... But, Dad, I wasn't thinking about myself. I don't care. Once started, I'll... I'll be what you bragged I was. Only it's so hard to give in. Jean leaned an arm against the side of the cabin, and bowing his face over it, he surrendered to the irresistible contention within his breast. And as if with a wrench, that strange inward hold broke. He let down. He went back, something that was boyish and hopeful, and in its place slowly rose the dark tide of his inheritance, the savage instinct of self-preservation bequeathed by his Indian mother, and the fierce, futile bloodlust of his Texan father. 
Then, as he raised himself, gripped by a sickening coldness in his breast, he remembered Ellen Jorth's face as she had gazed dreamily down off the rim, so soft, so different, with tremulous lips, sad, musing, with far-seeing stare of dark eye, peering into the unknown, the instinct of life still unlived. With confused vision and nameless pain, Jean thought of her. "'Dad, it's hard on the young folks,' he said bitterly. "'The sins of the father, you know. "'And the other side, how about Jorth? "'Has he any children?' "'What a curious gleam of surprise and conjecture "'Jean encountered in his father's gaze. "'He has a daughter, Ellen Jorth, "'named after her mother. "'The first time I saw Ellen Jorth, "'I thought she was a ghost of the girl I had loved and lost. "'Sight of her was like a blade in my side. "'But the looks of her and what she is they don't jibe. Old as I am, my heart, bah, Ellen Jorth is a damned hussy. Jean Isabel went off alone into the cedars. Surrender and resignation to his father's creed should have ended his perplexity and worry. His instant and burning resolve to be as his father had represented him should have opened his mind to slow cunning, to the craft of the Indian, to the development of hate. But there seemed to be an obstacle, a cloud in the way of vision, a face limned on his memory. Those damning words of his father had been a shock, how little or great he could not tell. Was it only a day since he had met Ellen Jorth? What had made all the difference? Suddenly, like a breath, the fragrance of her hair came back to him, the sweet coolness of her lips. Jean trembled. He looked around him as if he were pursued or surrounded by eyes, by instincts, by fears, by incomprehensible things. Uh-huh. That must be what ails me, he muttered. The look of her and that kiss, they've gone hard on me. I should never have stopped the talk. Am I to kill her father and leave her to God knows what? Something was wrong somewhere. Jean absolutely forgot that within the hour he had pledged his manhood, his life to a feud, which could be blotted out only in blood. If he had understood himself, he would have realized that the pledge was no more thrilling and unintelligible in its possibilities than this instinct which drew him irresistibly. Ellen Jorth. So my dad calls her a damned hussy. So that explains the way she acted, why she never hit me when I kissed her and her words, so easy and cool-like. Hussy? That means she's bad, bad, scornful of me, maybe disappointed because my kiss was innocent. It was, I swear. And all she said, oh, I've been kissed before. Jean grew furious with himself for the spreading of a new sensation in his breast that seemed now to ache. He had become infatuated all in a day with this Ellen Jorth. Was he jealous of the men who had the privilege of her kisses? No. But his reply was hot with shame, with uncertainty. The thing that seemed wrong was outside of himself. A blunder was no crime. To be attracted by a pretty girl in the woods, to yield to an impulse, was no disgrace nor wrong. He had been foolish over a girl before, though not to such a rash extent. Ellen Jorth, had stuck in his consciousness, and with her a sense of regret. Then swiftly rang his father's bitter words, the revealing, but the looks of her and what she is, they don't jibe. In the import of these words hid the meaning of the wrong that troubled him. Broodingly, he pondered over them. The looks of her, yes, she was pretty, but it didn't dawn on me at first. I, I was sort of excited, I liked to look at her, but didn't think. And now, consciously, her face was called up, infinitely sweet and more impelling for the deliberate memory. Flash of brown skin, smooth and clear, level gaze of dark, wide eyes, steady, bold, unseeing, red curved lips, sad and sweet. Her strong, clean, fine face rose before Jean, eager and wistful, one moment softened 
by dreamy, musing thought, and the next stormily passionate, full of hate, full of longing, but the more mysterious and beautiful. She looks like that. But she's bad, concluded Jean, with bitter finality. I might have fallen in love with Ellen Jorth if, if she had been different. But the conviction forced upon Jean did not dispel the haunting memory of her face, nor did it wholly silence the deep and stubborn voice of his consciousness. Later that afternoon, he sought a moment with his sister. Anne, did you ever meet Ellen Jorth? he asked. Yes, but not lately, replied Anne. Well, I met her as I was riding along yesterday. She was herding sheep, went on Jean rapidly. I asked her to show me the way to the rim, and she walked with me a mile or so. I can't say the meeting was not interesting, at least to me. Will you tell me what you know about her? Sure, Jean, replied his sister, with her dark eyes fixed wonderingly and kindly on his troubled face. I've heard a great deal, but in this Tonto Basin I don't believe all I hear. What I know, I'll tell you. I first met Ellen Jorth two years ago. We didn't know each other's names then. She was the prettiest girl I ever saw. I liked her. She liked me. She seemed unhappy. The next time we met was at a roundup. There were other girls with me, and they snubbed her. But I left them and went round with her. That snub cut her to the heart. She was lonely. She had no friends. She talked about herself, how she hated the people, but loved Arizona. She had nothing fit to wear. I didn't need to be told that she'd been used to better things. Just when it looked as if we were going to be friends, she told me who she was and asked me my name. I told her. Jean, I couldn't have hurt her more if I'd slapped her face. She turned white. She gasped. And then she ran off. The last time I saw her was about a year ago. I was riding a shortcut trail to the ranch where a friend lived, and I met Ellen Jorth riding with a man I'd never seen. The trail was overgrown and shady. They were riding close and didn't see me right off. The man had his arm around her. She pushed him away. I saw her laugh. Then he got hold of her again and was kissing her when his horse shied at sight of mine. They rode by me then. Ellen Jorth held her head high and never looked at me. And do you think she's a bad girl? demanded Jean bluntly. Bad? Oh, Jean exclaimed Anne in surprise and embarrassment. Dad said she was a damned hussy. Jean, Dad hates the Jorths. Sister, I'm asking you, what you think of Ellen Jorth? Would you be friends with her if you could? Yes. Then you don't believe she's bad? No. Ellen Jorth is lonely, unhappy. She has no mother. She lives alone among rough men. Such a girl can't keep men from handling her and kissing her. Maybe she's too free. Maybe she's wild. But she's honest, John. You can trust a woman to tell. When she rode past me that day, her face was white and proud. She was a Jorth, and I was an Isbel. She hated herself. She hated me. But no bad girl could look like that. She knows what's said of her all around the valley, but she doesn't care. She'd encourage gossip. Thank you, Anne, replied John huskily. Please keep this, this meeting of mine with her all to yourself, won't you? Why, Jean, of course I will. Jean wandered away again, peculiarly grateful to Anne for reviving and upholding something in him that seemed a wavering part of the best of him, a chivalry that had demanded to be killed by judgment of a righteous woman. He was conscious of an uplift, a gladdening of his spirit, yet the ache remained. More than that, he found himself plunged deeper into conjecture, doubt. Had not the Ellen Jorth incident ended? He denied his father's indictment of her and accepted the faith of his sister. Reckon that's about all, as Dad says, he soliloquized. Yet was that all? He paced under the cedars. He watched the sunset. He listened to the coyotes. He lingered there after the call for supper. 
until out of the tumult of his conflicting emotions and ponderings there evolved the staggering consciousness that he must see Ellen Jorth again. End of Chapter 3, Part 2《Seven of To the Last Man by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Part One. Ellen Jorth hurried back into the forest, hotly resentful of the accident that had thrown her in contact with an Isbel. Disgust filled her. Disgust that she had been amiable to a member of the hated family that had ruined her father. The surprise of this meeting did not come to her while she was under the spell of stronger feelings. She walked under the trees swiftly, with head erect, looking straight before her, and every step seemed a relief. Upon reaching camp, her attention was distracted from herself. Pepe, the Mexican boy, with the two shepherd dogs, was trying to drive sheep into a closer bunch to save the lambs from coyotes. Ellen loved the fleecy, tottering little lambs, and at this season she hated all the prowling beasts of the forest. From this time on for weeks the flock would be besieged by wolves, lions, bears, the last of which were often bold and dangerous. The old grizzlies that killed the ewes to eat only the milk bags were particularly dreaded by Ellen. She was a good shot with a rifle, but had orders from her father to let the bears alone. Fortunately, such sheep-killing bears were but few, and were left to be hunted by men from the ranch. Mexican sheep-herders could not be depended upon to protect their flocks from bears. Ellen helped Pepe drive in the stragglers, and she took several shots at coyotes, skulking along the edge of the brush. The open glade in the forest was favorable for herding the sheep at night, and the dogs could be depended upon to guard the flock, and in most cases to drive predatory beasts away. After this task, which brought the time to sunset, Ellen had supper to cook and eat. Darkness came, and a cool night wind set in. Here and there a lamb bleated plaintively. With her work done for the day, Ellen sat before a ruddy campfire and found her thoughts again centering around the singular adventure that had befallen her. Disdainfully, she strove to think of something else, but there was nothing that could dispel the interest of her meeting with Jean Isbel. Thereupon she impatiently surrendered to it, and recalled every word and action which she could remember. And in the process of this meditation she came to an action of hers, recollection of which brought the blood tingling to her neck and cheeks, so unusually and burningly that she covered them with her hands. What did he think of me, she mused doubtfully. It did not matter what he thought, but she could not help wondering. And when she came to the memory of his kiss, she suffered more than the sensation of throbbing scarlet cheeks. Scornfully and bitterly she burst out, Sure he couldn't have thought much good of me. The half-hour following this reminiscence was far from being pleasant. Proud, passionate, strong-willed Ellen Jorth found herself a victim of conflicting emotions. The event of the day was too close. She could not understand it. Disgust and disdain and scorn could not make this meeting with Jean Isabel as if it had never been. Pride could not efface it from her mind. The more she reflected, the harder she tried to forget, the stronger grew a significance of interest. And when a hint of this dawned upon her consciousness, she resented it so forcefully that she lost her temper, scattered the campfire, and went into the little teepee tent to roll in her blankets. Thus settled, snug and warm for the night, with a shepherd dog curled at the opening of her tent, she shut her eyes and confidently bade sleep end her perplexities. But sleep did not come at her invitation. She found herself wide awake, keenly sensitive to the sputtering of the campfire, the tinkling of the bells on the rams, the bleating of lambs, the sough of wind in the pines, and the hungry sharp bark of coyotes off in the distance. 
darkness was no respecter of her pride. The lonesome night, with its emphasis on solitude, seemed to induce clamoring and strange thoughts, a confusing ensemble of all those that had annoyed her during the daytime. Not for long hours did sheer weariness bring her to slumber. Ellen awakened late and failed of her usual alacrity. Both Pepe and the shepherd dog appeared to regard her with surprise and solicitude. Ellen's spirit was low this morning. Her blood ran sluggishly. She had to fight a mournful tendency to feel sorry for herself. At first, she was not very successful. There seemed to be some kind of pleasure in reveling in melancholy which her common sense told her had no reason for existence. But states of mind persisted in spite of common sense. Pepe, when is Antonio coming back? she asked. The boy could not give her a satisfactory answer. Ellen had willingly taken the sheep herder's place for a few days, but now she was impatient to go home. She looked down the green and brown aisles of the forest until she was tired. Antonio did not return. Ellen spent the day with the sheep, and in the manifold task of caring for a thousand newborn lambs, she forgot herself. This day saw the end of lambing time for that season. The forest resounded to the babble of blahs and bleats. When night came, she was glad to go to bed, for what with loss of sleep and weariness, she could scarcely keep her eyes open. The following morning she awakened early, bright, eager, expectant, full of bounding life, strangely aware of the beauty and sweetness of the scented forest, strangely conscious of some nameless stimulus to her feelings. Not long was Ellen in associating this new and delightful variety of sensations with the fact that Jean Isabel had set today for his ride up to the rim to see her. Ellen's joyousness fled. Her smiles faded. The spring morning lost its magic radiance. Sure, there's no sense in my lying to myself, she soliloquized thoughtfully. It's queer of me, feeling glad about him, without knowing. Lord, I must be lonesome. To be glad to see an Isbel, even if he is different. Soberly, she accepted the astounding reality. Her confidence died with her gaiety. Her vanity began to suffer. And she caught at her admission that Jean Isabel was different. She resented it in amaze. She ridiculed it. She laughed at her naive confession. She could arrive at no conclusion other than she was a weak-minded, fluctuating, inexplicable little fool. But for all that, she found her mind had been made up for her without consent or desire before her will had been consulted, and that inevitably and unalterably she meant to see Jean Isbel again. Long she battled with this strange decree. One moment she won a victory over this new, curious self, only to lose it the next. And at last, out of her conflict, there emerged a few convictions that left her with some shreds of pride. She hated all Isbels. She hated any Isbel, and particularly she hated Jean Isbel. She was only curious, intensely curious, to see if he would come back, and if he did come, what would he do? She wanted only to watch him from some covert. She would not go near him not let him see her or guess of her presence. Thus she assuaged her hurt vanity. Thus she stifled her miserable doubts. Long before the sun had begun to slant westward toward the mid-afternoon, Jean Isabel had set as a meeting time, Ellen directed her steps through the forest to the rim. She felt ashamed of her eagerness. She had a guilty conscience that no strange thrills could silence. It would be fun to see him, to watch him, to let him wait for her, to fool him. Like an Indian, she chose the soft pine-needle mats to tread upon, and her light moccasined feet left no trace. Like an Indian also, she made a wide detour and reached the rim a quarter of a mile west of the spot where she had talked with Jean Isabel, and here, turning east, she took care to step on the bare stones. This was an adventure. 
seemingly the first she had ever had in her life. Assuredly, she had never before come directly to the rim without halting to look, to wonder, to worship. This time she scarcely glanced into the blue abyss. All absorbed was she in hiding her tracks. Not one chance in a thousand would she risk. The Jorth pride burned even while the feminine side of her dominated her actions. She had some difficult rocky points to cross, then windfalls to round, and at length reached the covert she desired. A rugged yellow point of the rim stood somewhat higher than the spot Ellen wanted to watch. A dense thicket of jack pines grew to the very edge. It afforded an ambush that even the Indian eyes Jean Isabel was credited with could never penetrate. Moreover, if by accident she had made a noise and excited suspicion, she could retreat unobserved and hide in the huge rocks below the rim, where a ferret could not locate her. With her plan decided upon, Ellen had nothing to do but wait, so she repaired to the other side of the pine thicket and to the edge of the rim where she could watch and listen. She knew that long before she saw Isbel she would hear his horse. It was altogether unlikely that he would come on foot. Sure, Ellen Jorth, you're a queer girl, she mused. I reckon I wasn't well acquainted with you. Beneath her yawned a wonderful deep canyon, rugged and rocky with but few pines on the north slope, thick with dark green timber on the south slope. Yellow and gray crags, like turreted castles, stood up out of the sloping forest on the side opposite her. The trees were all sharp, spear-pointed. Patches of light green aspens showed strikingly against the dense black. The great slope beneath Ellen was serrated with narrow, deep gorges, almost canyons in themselves. Shadows alternated with clear, bright spaces. The mile-wide mouth of the canyon opened upon the basin, down into a world of wild, timbered ranges and ravines, valleys and hills that rolled and tumbled in dark green waves to the Sierra Anches. But for once Ellen seemed singularly unresponsive to this panorama of wildness and grandeur. Her ears were like those of a listening deer, and her eyes continually reverted to the open places along the rim. At first, in her excitement, time flew by. Gradually, however, as the sun moved westward, she began to be restless. The soft thud of dropping pine cones, the rustling of squirrels up and down the shaggy barked spruces, the crackling of weathered bits of rocks, these caught her keen ears many times and brought her up erect and thrilling. Finally she heard a sound which resembled that of an unshod hoof on stone. Stealthily, then, she took her rifle and slipped back through the pine thicket to the spot she had chosen. The little pines were so close together that she had to crawl between their trunks. The ground was covered with a soft bed of pine needles, brown and fragrant. In her hurry, she pricked her ungloved hand on a sharp pine cone and drew the blood. She sucked the tiny wound. Sure I'm wondering if that's a bad omen, she muttered, darkly thoughtful. Then she resumed her sinuous approach to the edge of the thicket and presently reached it. Ellen lay flat a moment to recover her breath, then raised herself on her elbows. Through an opening in the fringe of buck brush, she could plainly see the promontory where she had stood with Jean Isabel, and also the approaches by which he might come. Rather nervously, she realized that her covert was hardly more than a hundred feet from the promontory. It was imperative that she be absolutely silent. Her eyes searched the openings along the rim. The gray form of a deer crossed one of these, and she concluded it had made the sound she had heard. Then she lay down more comfortably and waited. Resolutely she held, as much as possible, to her sensorial perceptions. The meaning of Ellen Jorth lying in ambush, just to see an Isabel, was a conundrum she refused to ponder in the present. She was doing it, and the physical act had its fascination. Her ears 
attuned to all the sounds of the lonely forest, caught them and arranged them according to her knowledge of woodcraft. A long hour passed. The sun had slanted to a point halfway between the zenith and the horizon. Suddenly a thought confronted Ellen Jorth. He's not coming, she whispered. The instant that idea presented itself, she felt a blank sense of loss, a vague regret, something that must have been disappointment. Unprepared for this, she was held by surprise for a moment, and then she was stunned. Her spirit, swift and rebellious, had no time to rise in her defense. She was a lonely, guilty, miserable girl, too weak for pride to uphold, too fluctuating to know her real self. She stretched there, burying her face in the pine needles, digging her fingers into them, wanting nothing so much as that they might hide her. The moment was incomprehensible to Ellen and utterly intolerable. The sharp pine needles, piercing her wrists and cheeks and her hot heaving breast, seemed to give her exquisite relief. The shrill snort of a horse sounded near at hand. With a shock, Ellen's body stiffened. Then she quivered a little, and her feelings underwent swift change. Cautiously and noiselessly, she raised herself upon her elbows and peeped through the opening in the brush. She saw a man tying a horse to a bush somewhat back from the rim. Drawing a rifle from its saddle sheath, he threw it in the hollow of his arm and walked to the edge of the precipice. He gazed away across the basin and appeared lost in contemplation or thought. Then he turned to look back into the forest, as if he expected someone. Ellen recognized the lithe figure, the dark face so like an Indian's. It was Isbel. He had come. Somehow his coming seemed wonderful and terrible. Ellen shook as she leaned on her elbows. Jean Isabel, true to his word, in spite of her scorn, had come back to see her. The fact seemed monstrous. He was an enemy of her father. Long had range rumor been bandied from lip to lip. Old Gas Isabel had sent for his Indian son to fight the Jorths. Jean Isabel, son of a Texan, unerring shot, peerless tracker, a bad and dangerous man. Then there flashed over Ellen a burning thought. If it were true, if he was an enemy of her father's, if a fight between Jorth and Isbel was inevitable, she ought to kill this Jean Isbel right there in his tracks as he boldly and confidently waited for her. Fool he was to think she would come. Ellen sank down and dropped her head until the strange tremor of her arms ceased. That dark and grim flash of thought retreated. She had not come to murder a man from ambush, but only to watch him, to try to see what he meant, what he thought, to allay a strange curiosity. After a while she looked again. Isabel was sitting on an upheaved section of the rim, in a comfortable position from which she could watch the openings in the forest and gaze as well across the west curve of the basin to the Mazatals. He had composed himself to wait, he was clad in a buckskin suit, rather new, and it certainly showed off to advantage compared with the ragged and soiled apparel Ellen remembered. He did not look so large. Ellen was used to the long, lean, rangy Arizonians and Texans. This man was built differently. He had the widest shoulder of any man she had ever seen, and they made him appear rather short. But his lithe, powerful limbs proved he was not short. Whenever he moved, the muscles rippled. His hands were clasped round a knee, brown sinewy hands, very broad and fitting the thick muscular wrists. His collar was open, and he did not wear a scarf as did the men Ellen knew. Then her intense curiosity at last brought her steady gaze to Jean Isabel's head and face. He wore a cap, evidently of some thin fur. His hair was straight and short, and in color a dead raven black. His complexion was dark, clear tan, with no traces of red. He did not have the prominent cheekbones nor the high-bridged nose, usual with white men who were part Indian. 
Still he had the Indian look. Ellen caught that in the dark, intent, piercing eyes, in the wide, level, thoughtful brows, in the stern impassiveness of his smooth face. He had a straight, sharp-cut profile. Ellen whispered to herself, I saw him right the other day, only I'd not admit it. The finest-looking man I ever saw in my life is a damned Isbel. Was that what I came out here for? She lowered herself once more, and folding her arms under her breasts, she reclined comfortably on them, and searched out a smaller peephole from which she could spy upon Isbel. As she watched him, the new and perplexing side of her mind waxed busier. Why had he come back? What did he want of her? Acquaintance, friendship, was impossible for them. He had been respectful, deferential toward her in a way that had strangely pleased until the surprising moment when he had kissed her. That had only disrupted her rather dreamy pleasure in a situation she had not experienced before. All the men she had met in this wild country were rough and bold. Most of them had wanted to marry her, and, failing that, they had persisted in amorous attentions not particularly flattering or honorable. They were a bad lot and contact with them had dulled some of her sensibilities. But this Jean Isabel had seemed a gentleman. She struggled to be fair, trying to forget her antipathy, as much to understand herself as to give him due credit. True, he had kissed her, crudely and forcibly. But that kiss had not been an insult. Ellen's finer feelings forced her to believe this. She remembered the honest amaze and shame and contrition with which he had faced her, trying awkwardly to explain his bold act. Likewise, she recalled the subtle swift change in him at her words, Oh, I've been kissed before. She was glad she had said that. Still, was she glad after all? She watched him. Every little while he shifted his gaze from the blue gulf beneath him to the forest. When he turned thus, the sun shone on his face, and she caught the piercing gleam of his dark eyes. She saw, too, that he was listening, watching and listening for her. Ellen had to still a tumult within her. It made her feel very young, very shy, very strange. All the while she hated him, because he manifestly expected her to come. Several times he rose and walked a little way into the woods. The last time... He looked at the westering sun and shook his head. His confidence had gone. Then he sat and gazed down into the void. But Ellen knew he did not see anything there. He seemed an image carved in the stone of the rim, and he gave Ellen a singular impression of loneliness and sadness. Was he thinking of the miserable battle his father had summoned him to lead, of what it would cost of its useless pain and hatred. Ellen seemed to divine his thoughts. In that moment she softened toward him, and in her soul quivered and stirred an intangible something that was like pain, that was too deep for her understanding. But she felt sorry for an Isabel until the old pride resurged. What if he admired her? She remembered his interest, the wonder and admiration, the growing light in his eyes and it had not been repugnant to her until he disclosed his name. What's in a name, she mused, recalling poetry learned in her girlhood. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. He's an Isabel, yet he might be splendid, noble. Bah, he's not, and I'd hate him anyhow. End of chapter 4, part 1《Of to the Last Man》by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, Part 2 All at once Ellen felt cold shivers steal over her. Isbel's piercing gaze was directed straight at her hiding place. Her heart stopped beating. If he discovered her there, she felt that she would die of shame. Then she became aware that a blue jay 
was screeching in a pine above her, and a red squirrel somewhere near was chattering his shrill annoyance. These two denizens of the woods could be depended upon to espy the wariest hunter and make known his presence to their kind. Ellen had a moment of more than dread. This keen-eyed, keen-eared Indian might see right through her brushy covert, might hear the throbbing of her heart. It relieved her immeasurably to see him turn away and take the pacing the promontory with his head bowed and his hands behind his back. He had stopped looking off into the forest. Presently he wheeled to the west, and by the light upon his face, Ellen saw that the time was near sunset. Turkeys were beginning to gobble back on the ridge. Isbel walked to his horse and appeared to be untying something from the back of his saddle. When he came back, Ellen saw that he carried a small package, apparently wrapped in paper. With this under his arm, he strode off in the direction of Ellen's camp and soon disappeared in the forest. For a little while Ellen lay there in bewilderment. If she had made conjectures before, they were now multiplied. Where was Jean Esbel going? Ellen sat up suddenly. Well, sure this here beats me, she said. What did he have in that package? What was he going to do with it? It took no little willpower to hold her there when she wanted to steal after him through the woods and find out what he meant. But his reputation influenced even her, and she refused to pit her cunning in the forest against his. It would be better to wait until he returned to his horse. Thus decided, she lay back again in her covert and gave her mind over to pondering curiosity. Sooner than she expected, she espied Isabel approaching through the forest empty-handed. He had not taken his rifle. Ellen averted her glance a moment and thrilled to see the rifle leaning against a rock. Verily, Jean Isbel had been far removed from hostile intent that day. She watched him stride swiftly up to his horse, untie the halter, and mount. Ellen had an impression of his arrow-like straight figure and sinuous grace and ease. Then he looked back at the promontory, as if to fix a picture of it in his mind, and rode away along the rim. She watched him out of sight. What ailed her? Something was wrong with her, but she recognized only relief. When Isabel had been gone long enough to assure Ellen that she might safely venture forth, she crawled through the pine thicket to the rim on the other side of the point. The sun was setting behind the black range, shedding a golden glory over the basin. Westward, the zigzag rim reached like a streamer of fire into the sun. The vast promontories jutted out with blazing beacon lights upon their stone-walled faces. Deep down, the basin was turning shadowy dark blue, going to sleep for the night. Ellen bent swift steps toward her camp. Long shafts of gold preceded her through the forest. Then they paled and vanished. The tips of pines and spruces turned gold. A hoarse-voiced old turkey gobbler was booming his chug-a-lug from the highest ground, and the softer chick of hen turkeys answered him. Ellen was almost breathless when she arrived. Two packs and a couple of lop-eared burrows attested to the fact of Antonio's return. This was good news for Ellen. She heard the bleat of lambs and the tinkle of bells coming nearer and nearer, and she was glad to feel that if Isbel had visited her camp, most probably it was during the absence of the herders. The instant she glanced into her tent, she saw the package Isbel had carried. It lay on her bed. Ellen stared blankly. The impudence of him, she ejaculated. Then she kicked the package out of the tent. Words and actions seemed to liberate a damned-up hot fury. She kicked the package again and thought she would kick it into the smoldering campfire. But somehow she stopped short of that. She left the thing there on the ground. Pepe and Antonio hove in sight, driving in the tumbling woolly flock. Ellen did not want them to see the package, so with contempt for herself and somewhat lessening anger, she kicked it back into the tent. 
what was in it. She peeped inside the tent, devoured by curiosity. Neat, well-wrapped, and tied packages like that were not often seen in the Tonto Basin. Ellen decided she would wait until after supper and, at a favorable moment, lay it unopened on the fire. What did she care what it contained? Manifestly, it was a gift. She argued that she was highly incensed with this insolent Isbel, who had the effrontery to approach her with some sort of present. It developed that the usually cheerful Antonio had returned taciturn and gloomy. All Ellen could get out of him was that the job of a sheep herder had taken on hazards inimical to peace-loving Mexicans. He had heard something he would not tell. Ellen helped prepare the supper, and she ate in silence. She had her own brooding troubles. Antonio presently told her that her father had said she was not to start back home after dark. After supper, the herders repaired to their own tent, leaving Ellen the freedom of her campfire. Wherewith, she secured the package and brought it forth to burn. Feminine curiosity rankled strong in her breast, yielding so far as to shake the parcel and press it, and finally tear a corner off the paper, she saw some words written in lead pencil. Bending nearer the blaze, she read, For my sister Anne. Ellen gazed at the big, bold handwriting, quite legible and fairly well done. Suddenly, she tore the outside wrapper completely off. From printed words on the inside, she gathered that the package had come from a store in San Francisco. Reckon he fetched home a lot of presents for his folks, the kids and his sister, muttered Ellen. That was nice of him. Whatever this is, he sure meant it for his sister, Anne, Anne Isbel. Why, she must be that black-eyed girl I met and liked so well, before I knew she was an Isbel. His sister? Whereupon, for the second time, Ellen deposited the fascinating package in her tent. She could not burn it up just then. She had other emotions besides scorn and hate, and memory of that soft-voiced, kind-hearted, beautiful Isbel girl checked her resentment. I wonder if he is like his sister, she said thoughtfully. It appeared to be an unfortunate thought. Sean Isbel certainly resembled his sister. Too bad they belonged to the family that ruined Dad. Ellen went to bed without opening the package or without burning it and to her annoyance, wherever she lay, she appeared to touch this strange package. There was not much room in the little tent. First she put it at her head beside her rifle, but when she turned over, her cheek came in contact with it. Then she felt as if she had been stung. She moved it again, only to touch it presently with her hand. Next she flung it to the bottom of her bed, where it fell upon her feet and whatever way she moved them, she could not escape the pressure of this undesirable and mysterious gift. By and by she fell asleep, only to dream that the package was a caressing hand stealing about her, feeling for hers, and holding it with soft, strong clasp. When she awoke, she had the strangest sensation in her right palm. It was moist, throbbing, hot, and the feel of it on her cheek was strangely thrilling and comforting. She lay awake then. The night was dark and still, only a low moan of wind in the pines and the faint tinkle of a sheep bell broke the serenity. She felt very small and lonely lying there in the deep forest, and try how she would, it was impossible to think the same then as she did in the clear light of day. Resentment, pride, anger, these seemed abated now, if the events of the day had not changed her, they had at least brought up softer, kinder memories and emotions than she had known for long. Nothing hurt and saddened her so much as to remember the gay, happy days of her childhood, her sweet mother, her old home. Then her thought returned to Isbel and his gift. It had been years since anyone had made her a gift. What could this one be? It did not matter. The wonder was that Jean Isbel should bring it to her 
and that she could be perturbed by its presence. He meant it for his sister, and so he thought well of me, she said in finality. Morning brought Ellen further vacillation. At length she rolled the obnoxious package inside her blankets, saying that she would wait until she got home and then consign it cheerfully to the flames. Antonio tied her pack on a burrow. She did not have a horse and therefore had to walk the several miles to her father's ranch. She set off at a brisk pace, leading the burrow and carrying her rifle, and soon she was deep in the fragrant forest. The morning was clear and cool, with just enough frost to make the sunlit grass sparkle as if with diamonds. Ellen felt fresh, buoyant, singularly full of life. Her youth would not be denied. It was pulsing, yearning. She hummed an old southern tune, and every step seemed one of pleasure in action, of advance toward some intangible future happiness. All the unknown of life before her called. Her heart beat high in her breast, and she walked as one in a dream. Her thoughts were swift-changing, intimate, deep, and vague, not of yesterday or today, nor of reality. The big gray white-tailed squirrels crossed ahead of her on the trail, scampered over the piney ground to hop on tree trunks, and there they paused to watch her pass. The vociferous little red squirrels barked and chatted at her. From every thicket sounded the gobbles of turkeys. The blue jays squalled in the treetops. A deer lifted his head from browsing and stood motionless, with long ears erect, watching her go by. Thus happily and dreamily absorbed, Ellen covered the forest miles and soon reached the trail that led down into the wild breaks of Chevalon Canyon. It was rough going and less conducive to sweet wanderings of mind. Ellen slowly lost them, and then a familiar feeling assailed her, one she never failed to have upon returning to her father's ranch, a reluctance, a bitter dissatisfaction with her home, a loyal struggle against the vague sense that all was not as it should be. At the head of this canyon, in a little, level, grassy meadow, stood a rude, one-room log shack, with a leaning red stone chimney on the outside. This was the abode of a strange old man who had long lived there. His name was John Sprague, and his occupation was raising burrows. No sheep or cattle or horses did he own, not even a dog. Rumor had said Sprague was a prospector, one of the many who had searched that country for the lost Dutchman gold mine. Sprague knew more about the basin and the rim than any of the sheepmen or ranchers. From the Black Butte to the Sibicu, and from Chevlon Butte to Reno Pass, he knew every trail, canyon, ridge, and spring, and could find his way to them on the darkest night. His fame, however, depended mostly upon the fact that he did nothing but raise burrows, and would raise nothing but black burrows with white faces. These burrows were the finest bread in all the basin and were in great demand. Sprague sold a few every year. He had made a present of one to Ellen, although he hated to part with them. This old man was Ellen's one and only friend. Upon her trip out to the rim with the sheep, Uncle John, as Ellen called him, had been away on one of his infrequent visits to Grass Valley. It pleased her now to see a blue column of smoke lazily lifting from the old chimney and to hear the discordant bray of burrows. As she entered the clearing, Sprague saw her from the door of his shack. "'Hello, Uncle John,' she called. "'Well, if it ain't Ellen,' he replied heartily. "'When I seen that white-faced Jinny, I knew who was leading her. Where you been, girl?' Sprague was a little, stoop-shouldered old man, with gristled head and face, and shrewd gray eyes that beamed kindly on her, over his ruddy cheeks. Ellen did not like the tobacco stain on his grizzled beard, nor the dirty, motley, ragged, ill-smelling garb he wore, but she had ceased her useless attempts to make him more cleanly. "'I've been herding sheep,' replied Ellen. "'And where have you been, Uncle? I missed you on the way over.' "'Been packing in some grub. 
and I reckon I stayed longer in Grass Valley than I recollect. But that was only natural, considering. What? asked Ellen bluntly, as the old man paused. Sprague took a black pipe out of his vest pocket and began rimming the bowl with his fingers. The glance he bent on Ellen was thoughtful and earnest, and so kind that she feared it was pity. Ellen suddenly burned for news from the village. "'Well, come in and sit down, won't you?' he asked. "'No, thanks,' replied Ellen, and she took a seat on the chopping block. "'Tell me, Uncle, what's going on down in the valley?' "'Nothing much yet except talk, and there's a heap of that.' "'Huh. There's always talk,' declared Ellen contemptuously. "'A nasty, gossipy, catty hole, that grass valley.' "'Ellen, there's going to be war, a bloody war in the old Tonto Basin.' went on Sprague seriously. War? Between whom? The Isbels and their enemies. I reckon most people down there, and sure all the cattlemen, are on old Gass's side. Blaisdell, Gordon, Fredericks, Blue. They'll all be in it. Who are they going to fight? queried Ellen sharply. Well, the open talk is that the sheepmen are forcing this war. But there's talk not so open and I reckon not very healthy for any man to whisper hereabouts. Uncle John, you needn't be afraid to tell me anything, said Ellen. I'd never give you away. You've been a good friend to me. Reckon I want to be, Ellen, he returned, nodding his shaggy head. It ain't easy to be fond of you as I am and keep my mouth shut. I'd like to know something. Have you any relatives away from here that you could go to till this fight is over? No, all I have, so far as I know, are right here. How about friends? Uncle John, I have none, she said sadly, with bowed head. Well, well, I'm sorry. I was hoping you might get away. She lifted her face. Sure you don't think I'd run off if my dad got into a fight, she flashed. I hope you will. I'm a jorth, she said darkly, and dropped her head again. Sprague nodded gloomily. Evidently he was perplexed and worried, and strongly swayed by affection for her. "'Would you go away with me?' he asked. "'We could pack over to the Mazatels and live there till this blows over.' "'Thank you, Uncle John. You're kind and good, but I'll stay with my father. His troubles are mine.' "'Uh-huh. Well, I might have reckoned so. Ellen, how do you stand on this here sheep and cattle question?' I think what's fair for one is fair for another. I don't like sheep as much as I like cattle, but that's not the point. The range is free. Suppose you had cattle and I had sheep. I'd feel as free to run my sheep anywhere as you were to run your cattle. Right. But what if you throwed your sheep round my range and sheeped off the grass so my cattle would have to move or starve? Sure, I wouldn't throw my sheep round your range, she declared stoutly. Well, you've answered half of the question. And now suppose a lot of my cattle was stolen by rustlers, but not a single one of your sheep. What'd you think then? I'd sure think rustlers chose to steal cattle because there was no profit in stealing sheep. Exactly. But wouldn't you have a queer idea about it? I don't know. Why queer? What are you driving at, Uncle John? Well... Wouldn't you get kind of a hunch that the rustlers was, say, a little friendly toward the sheepmen? Ellen felt a sudden, vibrating shock. The blood rushed to her temples. Trembling all over, she rose. Uncle John, she cried. Now, girl, you needn't fire up that way. Set down and don't. Dare you insinuate my father has? Ellen, I ain't insinuating nothing, interrupted the old man. I'm just asking you to think, that's all. You're most grown into a young woman now, and you've got sense. There's bad times ahead, Ellen, and I hate to see you mix in them. Oh, you do make me think, replied Ellen, with smarting tears in her eyes. You make me unhappy. Oh, I know my dad is not liked in this cattle country, but it's unjust. He happened to go in for sheep raising. I wish he hadn't. It was a mistake. Dad always was a cattleman till he came here. He made enemies who, who ruined him, and everywhere misfortune crossed his trail. 
But, oh, Uncle John, my dad is an honest man. Well, child, I didn't mean to make you cry, said the old man feelingly, and he averted his troubled gaze. Never mind what I said. I'm an old meddler. I reckon nothing I could do or say would ever change what's going to happen. If only you wasn't a girl. There I go again. Ellen, face your future and fight your way. All youngsters have to do that. And it's the right kind of fight that makes the right kind of man or woman. Only you must be sure to find yourself. And by that I mean to find the real, true, honest-to-God best in you and stick to it and die fighting for it. You're a young woman, almost, and a blamed handsome one, which means you'll have more trouble and a harder fight. This country ain't easy on a woman, once slander has marked her. What do I care for talk down in that basin, returned Ellen. I know they think I'm a hussy. I've let them think it. I've helped them to. You're wrong, child, said Sprague earnestly. Pride and temper. You must never let anyone think bad of you, much less help them to. I hate everybody down there, cried Ellen passionately. I hate them so I glory in their thinking me bad. My mother belonged to the best blood in Texas. I am her daughter. I know who and what I am. That uplifts me whenever I meet the sneaky, sly suspicions of these basin people. It shows me the difference between them and me. That's what I glory in. Ellen, you're a wild, headstrong child, rejoined the old man in severe tones. Word has been passed again your good name, your honor, and haven't you given cause for that? Ellen felt her face blanch, and all her blood rush back to her heart in sickening force. The shock of his words was like a stab from a cold blade. If their meaning and the stern, just light of the old man's glance did not kill her pride and vanity, they surely killed her girlishness. She stood mute, staring at him, with her brown, trembling hands stealing up toward her bosom, as if to ward off another and a mortal blow. Ellen burst out Sprague hoarsely. You mistook me. Ah, I didn't mean what you think. I swear, Ellen, I'm old and blunt. I ain't used to women. But I've a love for you, child, and respect, just the same as if you were my own. And I know you're good. Forgive me. I meant only... Haven't you been, say, sort of careless? Careless? queried Ellen, bitterly and low, and powerful thoughtless, and blind, letting men kiss you and fondle you, when you're really a grown-up woman now. Yes, I have, whispered Ellen. Well, then, why did you let them? I don't know. I didn't think. The men never let me alone. Never, never. I got tired everlastingly pushing them away, and sometimes, when they were kind and I was lonely for something, I didn't mind if one or another fooled around. I never thought. It never looked as you have made it look. Then, those few times, riding the trail to Grass Valley, when people saw me, then I guess I encouraged such attentions. Oh, I must be. I'm a shameless little hussy. Hush that kind of talk, said the old man, as he took her hand. Ellen, you're only young and lonely and bitter. No mother, no friends, no one but a lot of rough men. It's a wonder you have kept yourself good. But now your eyes are open, Ellen. They're brave and beautiful eyes, girl, and if you stand by the light in them, you will come through any trouble. And you'll be happy. Don't ever forget that. Life is hard enough. God knows, but it's unfailing true in the end to the man or woman who finds the best in them and stands by it. Uncle John, you talk so kindly. You've made me have hope. There seems so little for me to live for, hope for. But I'll never be a coward again, nor a thoughtless fool. I will find some good in me, or make some, and never fail it, come what will. I'll remember your words. I'll believe the future holds wonderful things for me. I'm only eighteen. Sure, all my life won't be lived here. Perhaps this threatened fight over sheep and cattle will blow over. Somewhere, 
There must be some nice girl to be a friend, a sister to me, and maybe some man who'd believe, in spite of all they say, that I'm not a hussy. Well, Ellen, you remind me of what I was wanting to tell you when you just got here. Yesterday, I heard you call that name in a bar room, and there was a fellow there who raised hell. He nearly killed one man and made another plum eat his words, and he scared that crowd stiff. Old John Sprague shook his grizzled head and laughed, beaming upon Ellen as if the memory of what he had seen had warmed his heart. "'Was it you?' asked Ellen, tremulously. "'Me? Aw, oh, I wasn't nowhere. Ellen, this fellow was quick as a cat in his actions, and his words was like lightning.' Who, she whispered. Well, no one else but a stranger just come to these parts. And Isbel, too. Jean Isbel. Oh, exclaimed Ellen faintly. In a bar room full of men, almost all of them in sympathy with the sheep crowd, most of them on the Jorth side, this Jean Isabel resented an insult to Ellen Jorth. No, cried Ellen. Something terrible was happening to her mind or her heart. Well, he sure did, replied the old man, and it's going to be good for you to hear all about it. End of chapter 4, part 2